<laughs> Actually, you were just mentioning, you're like, if you really worry about security, maybe just don't use computers. And that, that's maybe part of what we're gonna talk about here, um, is that, you know, security isn't always a perfect thing, you know, and so we're just gonna try to work on being more secure maybe today if we can. Um, and yeah, just this kind of just an overview. Encryption is your friend. Uh, passwords, very important. And uh, make a backup plan. It's something we'll talk about very briefly. But, uh, you know, mostly, uh, yeah, I said security is not an, aspir an aspiration, not a uh, state, I guess. You know, it's uh, what I mean by that is just, yeah, it's. Yeah, maybe the most secure way to be uh, to live in, in the world is to just not use a computer, not be on the internet. But I don't think that's possible. So we're going to try to just improve security other ways. Um, my name is Dan Ficker, customer success engineer at Pantheon. Uh, you can find my website and Twitter and uh, yeah, and uh, oh yeah, there's my Drupal.org profile too. So that's just a little bit about me and. Uh, yeah, we're going to get right into it here and talk about passwords. Um, we'll f talk about ways to do more passwords more securely. And I have a personal story to start this off with. Um, about a year and a half ago, I got an email. It was this email. And it said, hey, you changed your email. And I was like, wait, I was just hanging out with my friends and definitely not using Netflix. I don't think I changed my email. So then I tried to log into Netflix and it was like, no. Uh, you don't have an account here anymore. And I'm like, uh-oh, that's not good. So <laughs> basically, uh, I called Netflix support and I said, hey, I have an account with you guys, but it seems like someone logged into my account. And, uh, and they're like, oh yeah, well, actually they're like, well, what's your email address? Well, what's your phone number? And they're like, no, nope, we don't have that in your system anymore. And I was like, oh, well, they changed that info. So. I ended up saying, well, like, I am paying for an account. And we'll say I was able to kind of, over the phone, give Netflix support, like, some information that proved, like, hey, this is, this is the credit card number I'm using, and this is, and it, it, this is person who's been paying for it. And sure enough, what I found, the, they, they reset, after verifying my payment information, reset my pass, or the email back to an email address I owned. But uh, I did see, when I logged back in, they had deleted the sub-user accounts and change the phone number to a phone number in Peru somewhere. So apparently, and I asked, well, they, I said, I'm kind of worried. How, how did they get my access and, you know, how did this happen? And he said, well, the only thing I can really do is just watch free movies with it. Like, it's not like they got into your bank account or something like that where, you know, they, can, they can't steal all your payment information on their website. So I was like, well, that's good. Yeah, you're right. Like, and I assume that's what they wanted to do was just log in watch free Netflix movies and TV shows until somebody noticed like, oh, hey, uh, I, don't, I can't access it anymore. But it got, it got my thinking, you know, and so why did this happen? Um, and how can I make sure this doesn't happen again? And generally I was doing the right things and I had just kind of forgotten that I hadn't updated my Netflix password in like probably a decade or two. And it was a password that I used to kind of use for everything. And so we're gonna talk about that a lot. Um, earlier that week, I also got this other email that said, hey, your password, this password, that was the same password I was using on Netflix, and I had put into a game website, like, again, like 10 years ago, uh, I put that password that I kind of used for everything, that was very simple, into that website 10 years ago, and now they were saying, by the way, somebody got a copy of all the passwords. We were actually storing these passwords in clear text, which, you know, you should probably have them at least somewhat encrypted in your database if you're gonna store passwords. Um, generally, actually, we'll talk about that hashing and type of thing too, where you shouldn't actually be storing the password at all. But they were storing the passwords in clear text. Somebody got a copy of that and just put it out on the internet. And so they're like, just so you know, this password and your email address are out there. And so I have to assume what happened is somebody saw, so, oh, hey, there's this email address and this password. Let me try it on Netflix and see if it still works. Um, and sure enough, it did. So then they got access to my Netflix account for a few hours. Um, thankfully, we'll talk about other ways to make sure you're not using the same passwords on every website. And I had been doing that for most of my, my accounts. But Netflix, you're like, oh, I've logged into Netflix on my iPad and my TV and my other TV, smart TV thing, you know, or whatever. So I'm logged into it in 20 different places. I don't want to change the password because then I have to log into all of them again. And so I just didn't do it. And that was kind of my problem. So, uh, 
yeah, I basically, yeah, I just used the standard email address and password and that gave me a big problem. So yeah, the, 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 the moral of the story, so really just don't use the same password for every single website. Um, it seems like a good way to just remember passwords, but it is definitely susceptible to this type of problem where you use the same password on a bunch of websites. Sooner or later, one of those websites is gonna get hacked and your password's gonna be figured out. Um, it just will not stay secret. So there's a couple ways to do, to see if this has even happened to you. There's a, a website called Have I Been Pwned. Instead of owned, it's pwned is kind of a hacker thing. P-W-N-E-D, have I been pwned.com? You can actually put in your email address or your password or something like that and it will search an anonymized database of mil or hundreds of different hacks that have happened on the internet. This is actually the results, the first screen of results when I do it for my email address. It says, oh yes, your email address showed up in an Adobe thing, a bit.ly thing, a ticketfly.com thing or something, a box.com, or no, dropbox.com, and a bunch of other things that are actually like an amalgam of a bunch of different usernames and passwords for all the different websites. So most likely there is a copy of your email address and maybe some other personal information about you on the internet. If you used any, pretty much any website, like these are big websites, some of these, um, and you probably had an account there at one point too. So uh, yeah, it's a great way to look at the information. Um, it doesn't actually keep or store your information. It just looks it up in the database that's already out there on the public internet. Um, and then, yeah, so basically, if you, if you can look at the information in here, the hackers probably also have this information as well. And so what we're gonna talk about is ways to do passwords better. Um, your password should be random or at least random-ish with alphabet, alphabetical characters, numbers, special characters. I would say to make sure it's not easily guessable, it should be long, 20 to 30 plus characters. Um, and it should be unique for each site, like I mentioned earlier. And the best way to do that is not to try to remember them. You could maybe come up with some sort of algorithm that makes some sort of random looking thing that is based on the site name, but even that could be reverse engineered. So what I'd recommend actually is you used some sort of system to manage passwords. Um, if you also, according to the national internet, or the, yeah, the national uh, standards body, the NIST, they say their newest guidelines as of 2017 say actually that you should actually use this type of long, really random password and don't actually change them every couple months or every couple, um, you know, not 90 days or something. It used to be kind of their recommendations, but they're saying now, yeah, don't, don't make it short, don't make it easy to remember, make it really long and random and have some sort of way to manage passwords. Um, and if you do that, actually they would say too, you don't need to change it every couple months. Um, we're gonna go on a little tangent before we talk about great ways to manage passwords, to also talk about encryption and how that relates to security on the internet as well. Um, by default, most things on the internet are public. That's just kind of how the internet was built. It was built as a way to look up public information. Um, since then, we've done a lot more with the internet than just look up public information. Uh, so encryption is basically using very fancy types of math to say there's no way you can actually figure out what this is unless you actually know this little secret bit of information that was given. So we're gonna talk about two different types of, types of encryption. The first one is called one-way encryption or hashing. So if you actually type in password one, a bad password, uh, into the encryption, if you put that into an encryption algorithm, you actually get out this little cipher text or it's an encrypted version of this text. Um, if you, if you try to actually kind of, there's no actually no way to kind of reverse this except for just guessing. So um, with a bad password like password one, it wouldn't be too hard for someone to say, oh, I figured out that they're using this encryption algorithm and that if I put in password one, I get the same thing. So, uh, but you know, the idea is basically, and this is what actually Drupal does, is when you type in the password for the first time, it actually runs this encryption algorithm and then stores this encrypted text in your database as what your password is. Um, and then when you actually log in, it does the same thing again. And it says, run it through this encryption algorithm and then does it actually match? And so it never actually even stores a plain text copy of your password in the database. It just 
runs this encryption algorithm when it first saves it, and then when you log in again, it compares, does they match? And that's, that's a great way to do it because there's no, well, it's, it, it's harder for someone to actually figure out what the password is. They basically have to either try all the encrypted th unencrypted things and run the encryption algorithm to see what matches, or they just have to guess, one of the two. Um, trying can take a long time, depending on lots of factors, but um, yeah, probably the process is not reversible. Um, so even if you have this information, it's not very easy to get back to the other one, uh, the unencrypted version. And yeah, commonly used for passwords. Uh, the next one we'll talk about is public key, key encryption. And so you have two different pieces here, the public key and the private key. Um, it's kind of like a special way of encoding messages so that you have to have one or the other, and otherwise it just looks like very random information. So, so yeah, the private key must be kept secret, and the public key can be given to anybody else. And so you can encrypt or decrypt messages with one or the other. So I can send a message with the private key, or the public key, and the, only the person with the private key can actually un, unencrypt that information. Uh, I'll have a little diagram here on the next one. So this is where you what you'd want to do generally for kind of keeping data in a way that is is secure. Um, this is kind of this is my diagram. So it's a little complicated, but if you just take the unencrypted data and transfer it across the internet, it's not secure. That's not a good idea. But what you would do instead is um, from the public key, you're saying, hey, I want to talk to this website, first I'm going to encrypt it with this public key that they've already given me, and then send it across the internet. The Only then the actual server that has the corresponding private key can decrypt the information, and then vice versa. When it sends you information back from the server, it can encrypt that information uh, with the private key, and then only a person that has the public key can decrypt it. Um, so that's a little, a little complicated, I know, but that's basically how all encryption on the internet works. So when you're connecting to an HTTPS website, uh, this is actually what happens, basically, is, uh, is the server has a private key on it, and then it gives you a copy of the public key right away and says, hey, this is, uh, this is how you can communicate with me from now on. And, uh, and so then you basically encrypt that information before it leaves your computer or your phone, and then it gets decrypted at the server and vice versa. So we'll talk about here as well, is your data actually encrypted? Uh, this is kind of just what I was talking about. HTTPS means that it is encrypted, uh, or it generally does mean that. There is actually a part of the HTTPS protocol that's not encrypted, but it looks like it's encrypted. It's not really used anymore anyway, but um, Yes, yeah, so the S means secure, and it uses this, again, public key encryption, public-private key encryption. These days, well, this is actually changing really quick. It used to be that browsers would often have some sort of a padlock icon on there if it's secure, and maybe nothing if it's not secure. Uh, it's definitely changing a lot. Recently, the browsers are now saying, uh, actually, we'll just assume everything's secure and only really like throw up big warnings for you if it's not secure. Um, and that's actually a good thing, I think, because basically it just means a few years ago, anytime you visit a website, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be that secure. And so it could even be that somebody was like modifying the website as it was transmitted to you. Um, with HTTPS, that's not really possible. Um, unless they actually are decrypting it at some point and re-encrypting it, which would be a lot harder to do. Um, IT people at your company, if they own the computer, they can do that kind of thing if they want to. Um, uh, so that's something we are aware of, but it's not usually a, too much of a problem. So uh, yeah, anything on a website could be uh, viewed or copied by any computer. Um, actually, we'll talk about that in a second too here, about the Wi-Fi here and that type of thing. but. Uh, any, yeah, any, without HTTPS, any router or computer between your computer and the server could actually just say, oh, hey, look, there's a copy of the data going by, and I might just keep a copy just because it sounds like interesting information. So um, that's why we don't recommend using HTTPS. 
uh, for websites. Um, I'll just yeah make a note here. So if you actually in your iPhone try to connect to the library Wi-Fi, if you look in the details, it actually gives you this message here saying, "Hey, this is an unencrypted, un un unencrypted connection, unsecured account." Um, so unsecured network. And basically what that means is anybody in, in this building who's just sitting there watching on the laptop could, could actually be looking at and taking down information of at least what websites you're visiting. Um, if it's an unencrypted non-HTTPS website, they could even see all the data that's coming by, what you're submitting and what you're uh, downloading. Um, for, so maybe for some reason, there might be a reason you don't want to actually connect to these types of things. It may be a little bit more secure to actually use your cell phone network if you can. Um, this is maybe not as much of an issue as it was when five year, three or five years ago when all the websites were not using HTTPS. Now most websites are using HTTPS, especially the biggest ones. There was a point, yeah, like five years ago where Facebook and Google weren't even using HTTPS that much, especially Facebook. And so it was pretty easy to be like, oh, hey, look, so this person's visiting Facebook and they have this cookie ID. Let me just you know, put that cookie ID in my thing too, in my browser too, and now I'm logged in as them. So, you know, that was actually a problem five or six years ago. And, that, and, and if you're using a public Wi-Fi, it might be pretty easy for someone to do that. And so now that doesn't happen because HTTPS is being used on more websites. So it might be better than it was to, not as much of an issue than it was to connect to the public Wi-Fi, but maybe if you're worried about security, maybe it's not a good idea to do that either. Um, and yeah, now we're going to talk about password managers. Um, and this is where we get into lots of secure fun. But anyway, uh, the, idea, the couple concepts we have here, password vault is basically some sort of a uh, secure way of encrypting a lot of information about passwords and logins. Um, and then you could even, if you have that done well and securely, you could actually just put that on the internet. And the only way for someone to actually get that is if they have your password or your kind of private key, that type of information. So uh, these are a bunch of different password manager programs that I re highly recommend. Um, LastPass is the one that I use. Um, it's to some extent free. I pay, what is it, 20 bucks a year or something like that to, to use their premium features, I guess. There's a few premium features. Um, and there's also a one password is another solution. Uh, if you have all Apple devices, Apple's iCloud Keychain basically does this for you as well. Um, and KeePass is an open source solution if you want to provide your own cloud and your own uh, software. I mean, you, you can use the KeePass software and maybe just put it in a Dropbox account or something like that. Um, or some sort of little cloud storage system that you've set up. Um, so those are, those, are, those are the solutions that you can use for password managers. And here's some of the features that they have. Um, both LastPass and 1Password basically have integration software for almost every operating system and almost every browser. So on all my computers at home and at work, I actually have the LastPass plugin and the LastPass desktop application so I can kind of look through all my passwords in Firefox, Chrome, any of the other browsers. It actually, when I go to a website that I've been to before, it actually just fills in the password and I can just hit submit. Um, on new sites, it actually pops in a little bo box saying, oh, you're signing up for a new account. Here's just a random 38 character password and we'll just keep a copy of it as soon as you hit save. So it, it makes it very easy, at least on your desktop machine, to, uh, to, to generate new passwords, save passwords, even change the passwords from time to time. Um, and give you a UI to kind of just look up, like, what is the password here? And to copy it to your clipboard or do that type of thing as well. Um, yeah, it saves your logins. Uh, yeah, and most of these have a very good ecosystem of apps for your phone. Um, actually, on, on the latest couple of versions of iOS, iPhone and iPad, there's actually a built-in uh, integration with the browsers on those those machine or those things and and actually apps. So even when you log into an app or the app has a little login screen, there's a little button there that says, "Hey, open the LastPass application and fill in the password for this app or for this website," um, which makes it even easier. Before that, you had to kind of log in or 
like open up the LastPass app and copy out your password and paste it in. But you don't even have to do that anymore on your on your phones. Um, let's see, notes area. Oh yeah, so that's another thing I use. The notes area is for kind of just keeping other data related to that account. Um, one thing that I do, a lot of websites ask for some little what if you forgot your password kind of data. You know, what's your mother mother's maiden name or this and that. And instead of actually filling those out with honest answers, I actually just fill it out with some random words or something that I find on the internet. And that way, I, and then I save a copy of that within the LastPass application right there with my password. So, you know, right under the password, there's a notes section. And I just say, you know, what's your mother's maiden name or what's their first pet's name? And then just put something silly in there. Usually, actually, I keep it to like two or three random words because then if I actually have to call the company and they want to actually verify this information over the phone, I can at least give them something that's not a 80 character random password or something just that would be really hard to, to read to them. But, you know, I can give them four random words I pulled out of a dictionary. <laughs> And then they can kind of say, oh yeah, that doesn't make sense because that's not your mother's maiden name, but at least it's verifying that yes, you have this information. Um, another thing we'll talk about for being more secure on the internet is multi-factor authentication. Um, let's see, yeah. Authentication is process of verifying uh, who you are when you say you are, and there's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, the most common one, every one is familiar with is passwords, uh, something you know, basically, a PIN or access code, a password. Um, there are also other different types of authentication, something you have, a little token or fob or card or something, and then something you are as well, which is kind of like your fingerprint, your your, your eye, eye print or DNA or something like that. And these are all ways you can kind of verify that you are the holder of these this account or this information. Um, so there's a number of different ways this information can be used. Um, sometimes you will see multi-factor authentication used to just kind of make it easier to use a another one. So instead of actually like a temporary replacement, instead of actually requiring you to type in a password on my phone, I now have a 12 character password as my main password. But I also have you know, the touch ID or face ID on my iPhone which makes it easier to, most of the time I don't have to enter that really long password. I only just have to enter, um, you know, or I just have to give it my thumb or my show of my face and then it says, okay, yeah, you're good. But next time you restart the phone or if it's been like a day or so, or there's even an option to kind of, you know, hit a certain series of buttons and then it will actually kind of lock the phone and you'll actually have to use your password. Um, so that, that that type of thing, and then then I then it can more for more security security reasons, basically kind of make sure that it is me. Um, yeah, and actually one of the reasons it does that is like in the U.S., you can be kind of compelled to give you know your fingerprint or your to show show your face and <laughs> that type of thing, and so. Uh, while you while you cannot actually be compelled to like give give over your password at least in the U.S. legally at this point, um, so that might be a reason why to not use these if you're really worried about security. But um, another thing that happens sometimes too uh, is you can use more than one of these factors to actually double verify basically that you are who you say you are. Like I do have one main password that I remember to get into my LastPass account. Uh, but actually, even if I told somebody that, or if I, uh, you know, somebody figured out what it was, they actually need a second thing, which is this little USB token here called a YubiKey, uh, and I have that on my keychain all the time, so I have to type in my password, and then I also have to, like, plug this in the computer and hit the little button on it, and it actually puts out a, a, another encrypted kind of key that it's expecting and says, oh yeah, that actually is Dan because he actually has that password and he has this information on him. Um, so that's another kind of level of security is you have two different pieces of information to verify that you are who you say you are. Um, let's see, more information about security, let's see. Ah, okay, so we have a fun little section here of a few other things. 
to keep in mind about security. Um, this one is somewhat troubling. Phone, num phone numbers can be somewhat insecure. Like there's been, you know, most of these, a lot of companies do like to have you send them a text message with a code to verify. Uh, and there are some problems with that. There have been some cases where somebody either knows somebody who works for a phone company and is just like, hey, can you just copy this guy's number or move it over to me? And then I can just steal all this information. Um, that's actually not too hard to do if you work for a phone company, from what I understand. So it might be not good to do that. Um, the other thing that sometimes happens is the weakest link is the customer service person there. And so I've heard recordings of people saying like, hey, my wife is out of town and has a sound of a crying baby in the background. And like, I need access to her phone because like things are just going crazy. And the customer service person will sometimes do it because they're convinced and they just want to be helpful. And that's not too helpful because it actually gives the bad people access to your account. But it, it can happen. And uh, so maybe one of the solutions is to not use SMS text messaging as a verification tool. There are apps on your phone, like the Google Authenticator, um, LastPass, Twitter, Facebook. Um, these, all, these all have systems to actually use secure information in their apps that are already on your phone to actually verify that may be more secure than using a cell phone number and a text message. Uh, uh, the downside of that is actually, yeah, that sometimes, well, well, when you get a new phone, you actually have to set it up on the new phone probably before you actually throw away or get rid of the old phone. Um, just otherwise you might lock yourself out if you don't have access to those applications anymore with those verification codes. Um, usually they also give you some sort of like a one-time set of codes that you could print out or keep in a secure place to uh, get back in as well if you want. But that's another downside of some of these types of encryption is uh, sometimes there's not really much of a backup if you, remember, if you forget what your password or what your secure information was. Oh, and I went too far. Yeah, so, oh, okay, yeah. Okay, did I go, oh yeah, I hit a whole bunch of pages there, okay. So, let's see. Yeah, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but sometimes the weak spot is actually not that your password's bad, it's that the way that you, you what, what happens if you forget your password is bad. And that's where I talked about, you know, some of the, you know, security questions, I, I usually don't answer those truthfully because somebody could probably look up what my mother's maiden name or where I was born or that type of thing is, um, or my favorite type of dog or something, I don't know, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, that type of thing. Uh, so they might be able to figure that information out so you don't actually probably want to use that to answer your security questions. Because um, then they don't even need your password, they just say, oh, I forgot it, and then say, oh, hey, I know the answers to these questions or I can look them up. Um, so that's why I said, yeah, create some random words or something else to answer them with um, and then store that in your password manager. Um, one other little topic I wanted to mention was kind of there's two different things about, um, yeah, trust and security. Uh, so the question is really just who do you trust to keep your information safe? Um, I think that's really an important question. Um, and in, to some extent, you don't have to, let's see, if it, like the way that security and encryption type things work is actually you don't really need to, like in some ways you might be able to say that you don't need to actually trust a company like LastPass or 1Password with your data because, and I think this is true with both LastPass and 1Password, is they've, they've made things such that they have, they just keep, this file for you up on the internet that is your password information. And whenever you say, hey, I'm Dan, I'm looking for this information, it'll download a copy to your computer or to your phone, and then only then does it get unencrypted into your computer or your phone. There's actually no way for LastPass or 1Password to actually look at this information unless you actually have your email address, your password, and actually I think 1Password even has like kind of an extra security key you have to give them when you when you log in, um, and so basically, yeah, they have this kind of encrypted piece of information. They don't even know what's in there, and when you actually load it in your application, 
is only when you get access to it. So to some extent, you don't even have to trust that they will keep your data secure um, because they've built it in a way. And third party people have kind of verified this, that like, yes, they are encrypting it well and they are doing it in a way. And then, although you still have to somewhat trust them that like, they're not gonna change this next week when they ask you to re-enter your password for some reason. So th there's a certain question, yeah, of like what is security and who do you trust to keep your information secure? Um, so you ha you, to some extent, you do have to trust your internet service provider, your telephone company, and your any cloud services providers that they actually do have your best interest uh, or that you at least pay them to, to be trustworthy or something like that. Uh, and that should be something you at least kind of think about, I guess, you know, just is that something I can live with or should maybe I be doing this some other way that um, it's with a company that I do trust. Um, and usually that's what I was talking about just a minute ago, the idea of trusting no one is maybe the idea that uh, your information is actually encrypted in such a way that no one is actually else be able to get them, even the providers that you actually are using. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's see, yeah, so the, the, like I said, there's kind of a, a little bit of a upside and downside of that is you control your own destiny and security. Uh, some of that uh, power comes with responsibility as well. You have to make sure you keep this secure information safe and, and that you maintain access to it, that you don't forget how to access it or, uh, um, run out of ways to access it. So, and then I mentioned I'd, I'd talk about this as well. I'm looking like I'm flying through this pretty well, but uh, basically uh, it's also a good idea to make sure you have backups of this information. If you're using something like LastPass or 1Password, it is on your phone, on your computer. You can actually access it in an offline mode where it would later sync up to the internet, but it's also in the cloud on the internet. Um, but gen generally in just all your information, it's a good idea to make sure you have a backup and maybe not just have a backup in one spot, have to have a backup in two or three spots, um, just to make sure your information is secure. Uh, um, put it in a, yeah, you could, yeah, if you have some of these password like uh, retrieval things that are really important uh, ways to get back into your account, um, maybe even print it out, put it in a safe deposit box. That would be a secure place to put it um, where I mean, assuming you trust your bank, <laughs> you know, that type of thing, but um, a good place to kind of keep that information away from anyone who would want to do something bad. So I think that's mostly what I've got. I just on the website at Drupal Corn, you can actually find all these slides if you're looking for some more information. And I would love to answer any questions people have about internet security, personal internet security. I, I just didn't really go into uh, being secure as a web developer and kind of how your company should be set up in security because that's a whole other question I think that uh, you maybe want to have some sort of, uh, yeah, I mean that's a business question I think. <laughs> I just mostly wanted to talk about using it for your own personal use. Um, and actually I do have, this is a YubiKey is what I was talking about, this kind of two-factor authentication system. This is an old one that I'm not using anymore, so if somebody really wants one for free, I can give it away for you. I have another one on my keychain, so um, if somebody wants that, um, yeah, you can just come up here and take it, I guess. But um, <laughs> does anybody have any good questions? Any, any questions at all, actually? So. so, if you found that your email was on that list that you provided, mm -hmm. like it, it's out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What's your recommend what is your next steps of recommendation once you found those things? Like just go change your password on those websites? Um, yeah, I mean I think uh, that's a good question. I I yeah, I, I think it's mostly just to be aware that like, you know, at some point, yeah. And, well, it depends. Like sometimes it's just that your email address and your name, and like it, well, I think list there kind of what information was there. It might say, hey, your email address was there with your your name and your your billing your payment address or something like that. And then you know that means that somewhere out on the internet, people could just look up like, oh, I, I now I know where at least one point somebody's payment address was or something like that. But I think if it's if, if it's a little bit if it says it includes the passwords there. 
um, then you might want to make sure you're not using that password anywhere else on other websites um, and you want to change and update your passwords, yeah. Um, it, yeah, it can be a little complicated to decide exactly what needs to be done there and um, it usually says kind of approximately when that information showed up on the internet, but sometimes it could even be a little older than that because pretty often these hacked things are not shown up publicly on the internet right away, they're put out publicly later after they were kind of changed hands a few times. They, people sell this information around the internet and stuff like that too. So I don't know if I answered your question very well, but <laughs> but yeah, it's a uh, yeah. I think in general, the uh, my recommendation is just to start using kind of these password managers and kind of a random password on every website if you can. And it's not an overnight process, I don't think, to do that. But um, you know, it's something you can at least try to start using uh, if you're not already, so. Um, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Um, are you using any uh, personal VPN system? And you know. So how, how would you go about like, choosing? That's a good question. I haven't really been using too much any, any sort of VPN system. Um, for the most part, to some extent, I'm kind of like, and that's where I, I was talking about just kind of security is kind of a spectrum. Like I don't feel like I'm that much of a target that like, you know, I want to use a VPN when I'm here at the conference or, you know, in a coffee shop somewhere. Um, it, in, in some cases, I might just not use the public Wi-Fi and just use my cell phone network if that works pretty well. Um, but yeah, I think there's there's a lot of VPN solutions out there, and that's a good question about which one you want to trust, and I, I don't have a good answer, I think, on that. I think it's, um, a lot of VPN providers will say stuff like, you know, hey, we don't actually keep logs of who's logging in and, you know, what what you're visiting and stuff like that, and that could be helpful um, and, and just helping make sure that you understand, that you feel, like, secure. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sometimes, you know, VPNs are used for other purposes as well, but um, sometimes you can even set up your own VPN in your, like your router or a computer at home, something like that too, if you want to you know, really make sure you're not trusting anyone else to provide you this VPN service, but that's going to be a little bit more work. You have to set up a server or at least set up some software. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a good question or answer for that, but yeah. That's yeah. Oh, I do have actually one more slide here, I think. Oh. One of the places I've learned a lot of this information is from a podcast called Security Now uh, with Steve Gibson and Leo Laporte. And uh, it's been going on for about 13 years, like almost every week, um, maybe even more than that now. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it, it, like their earlier episodes kind of talked a lot about kind of security and the internet in general. And nowadays they talk a lot about kind of uh, very, uh, the, the week's security news and kind of a lot of security information. But if you want to, if you're looking for a podcast to listen to, it's a, it's a pretty good one. Every once in a while it gets a little over my head even. It's very technical sometimes, but it's, uh, it's, it's very, I find it very interesting to kind of hear what, uh, he, he's been in security and software for 30 some years. And so he has a lot of information about, uh, about using, using the internet and security too. So. But I like listening to that, and that's where I've learned a lot of this information too. So, he also has his own little passwordless QR code login system that he's going to be rolling out here at some point too. I don't know if that'll actually catch on, but it sounds like kind of interesting. So, um, but that's that's all I have. Anybody else have any questions? But otherwise, we can just get ready for a closing closing session, I guess. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.